Good afternoon, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It's an amazingly beautiful day here. It's Friday afternoon, 5 November 2021, and I'm putting together an episode that you will hear no earlier than tomorrow morning. This is going to be released on Saturday, November 6th, 2021. It's a conversation, actually, that I had last week with retired Air Force Colonel Nicole Malakowski. Now, she may not be a household name to everybody, but anybody that's interested in flying or who follows the Air Force or who follows remarkable people has probably heard of Nicole Malakowski. She is a retired colonel in the United States Air Force, but she was one of the first women ever to be selected as a combat fighter pilot in the military. So for years, women weren't allowed to fly in the Air Force at all. And then for many years, they were allowed to fly, but not in any type of combat role and certainly never in fighter aircraft. And when she was a little girl, she had an experience where she saw the Air Force Thunderbirds perform. And she told her parents at age six or seven that she was going to be a fighter pilot someday. And at the time, not only were women not allowed to fly combat aircraft, but women were not allowed in the military demonstration teams either. So the the two aspects of her dream were impossible and against the law at the time that she came up with those ideas in her heart. Well, she's got an inspiring story about how she not only accomplished all those goals, but went on to become a decorated pilot, squadron commander, com- uh, has 188 combat hours and Iraqi freedom and Operation Deliberate Forge. She flew the F-15E Strike Eagle, which I still think is one of the coolest airplanes ever made. And she's got over 2,300 flight hours and six different Air Force aircraft from the T-3 all the way up to the F-16. She did make it as the first Thunderbird pilot. She's going to tell you that story. But the reason I have her on is not just because she was a Thunderbird pilot, not just because she was one of the first women to ever become fighter pilots in the Air Force, but because she has some other remarkable aspects of her story right at the peak of her career. And I'm talking about After she was in the Thunderbirds, after she was a squadron commander, she was actually selected to go to the White House and served on uh, some teams there advising the First Lady and uh, even Jill Biden at one point and was just having kind of the apex of her career when she was struck down by an incredible challenge that actually turned out to be life-threatening. And her response to that is the reason I invited her here. Today, Nicole Malachowski is a worldwide renowned public speaker advocate for her uh, situation that she went through. I'll let her tell you about that. But she basically has turned her adversity into a strength, and she's now one of the leading experts and uh, inspiring figures in the world at raising funds and raising awareness for tick-borne illnesses. And so she just has this remarkable story. It was a great conversation. She's a lot of fun to talk to. Lisa and I enjoyed very much an opportunity to meet her and speak with her. Nicole Malakowski lives in Colorado with her husband, Paul, who's also retired uh, from the Air Force. He was a weapons systems officer uh, for F-15s as well, and they have two twin 11 year olds Nora and Garrick and I'm excited to bring you today Nicole Malakowski now the most important aspect of her story is that she did something that I'm always telling you to do when she was at the height of adversity she figured out what she needed to do and she started today Hey, I'm so glad to have you listening today. It's season three of the Dr. Lee Warren podcast. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredibly beautiful and brilliant wife, Lisa Warren, my better half in every way. She's my better two thirds. My father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get that done you can get the show notes and more on my website at wlewarnmd.com and if you like the show please subscribe you're doing a great job doing that as the podcast has now exceeded 30,000 downloads a month please subscribe share it with your friends let's help this thing get far and wide i'm dr lee warren here to help you change your mind so you can change your life we've got colonel nicole malakowski former united states air force fighter pilot and air force thunderbird let's get after it Hey, friend, we're back, and I'm so excited to share my new friend with you. Um, I've got Nicole Malakowski, a Colonel Nicole Malakowski with me today. Hey, Nicole, how are you? I am wonderful. Thanks for having me on, Lee. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, of course, anybody that knows me or spends very much time around me knows that I'm kind of a, um, a fighter pilot geek. So I never had the eyes to fly. Both both my parents were private pilots, and I grew up in Cessnas and Satabras and, and flying and always thought I was going to fly. And, and I got in the Air Force, and, and I, I couldn't fly because I had bad eyes. So um, I guess they can fix all that now. But But you are an Air Force fighter pilot. That's remarkable. Well, thank you. Well, my excuse is my brain isn't big enough to be a neurosurgeon, so call it even, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so how did how, how did a, how did a little girl growing up in the United States um, decide that you wanted to become a fighter pilot? How'd that come about? Well, you know, you said something really interesting in that question, which is growing up in the United States, and it's always a reminder to me that I really won the lottery being born in this country. And I think I won the lottery, especially as a woman being born in this country, because we have a lot of opportunities that women around the world don't actually have. And, you know, we see that play out today in Afghanistan and such. So I want to acknowledge how lucky I am to have been born in the United States. Um, I remember the exact time that I decided I wanted to become a fighter pilot. Um, I had grown up in a solid middle-class American family in central California, Uh, Both of my grandfathers had served in the military. Um, So I grew up knowing that military service was honorable and noble and good. We were the family that would go to the Veterans Day Parade and, you know, put our hands over the heart, you know, with the national anthem and, you know, salute the flag kind of a thing. Um, And about the time I was five, six years old, my family, uh, we went to the local air show. Uh, just like a lot of American families do when the air show comes to town. And I remember there was an aircraft there called the F-4 Phantom, which, you know, was the workhorse of the Vietnam War. And it came by the runway low and fast. And I remember it was just so loud. I put my hands over my ears to cover it. And I remember feeling the rumbling in my chest and I could smell the jet fuel. And I started shaking. You know how little kids shake with excitement? Like they just can't what's going on. (laughs) That's what happened to me. And I remember thinking that is what I'm going to do someday. This was about 1979. Wow. That was actually at the time, as you know, it was against the law for women to become fighter pilots. Yep. So, but a five, six year old kid is not concerned with congressional law. All I know is that I loved what I saw. And I remember looking at my family that day and saying, I'm going to be a fighter pilot someday. Wow. That's what set it off. (laughs) Wow. And you pursued that. And so, um, so did you ever waver? Like, was it, did, did somebody tell you, Hey, you can't do that. You're a girl that, that can't happen. Like, sure. I mean, well, I mean, and, you know, it, that of course definitely happened. Some of it was just cultural paradigms and unconscious mm-hmm. bias, but some of it was fact, right? I mean, at the time, factually speaking, women were not uh, allowed by law in order to fly fighters. I, I remember a very distinct moment in sixth grade, Um, our sixth grade teacher had asked each of us kids to come into school. And on Fridays, one person was going to stand up and talk about what they wanted to become when they, they grew up and how they were going to get there. That was our assignment. And then, you know, a few weeks or months into this, you know, it was my turn. And I remember standing up in front of the class and saying, I want to be a fighter pilot someday. And I remember everybody laughing. And my teacher said, you probably should sit down and come back next week when you have something more realistic. Wow. That hurt. And I remember going home and just crying tears, thinking to myself, well, maybe this is a dream that can't, you know, can't happen. Now, to be honest, I don't think my teacher was trying to be rude or mean. I think it could have been handled a lot more delicately. However, Mm -hmm. it was factual what he was saying, because it was still against the law for women to be fighter pilots. Um, the beauty of that is in that moment of tears and and feeling like maybe this dream can't come true. My family ended up going on a vacation to Washington, DC, and we ended up at the Smithsonian air and space museum. And there in a far dusty corner, dark, dusty corner, hidden away from everything else was a small little exhibit on the WASP, the women air force service pilots of world war II, America's first women, military aviators. And when I saw their history and I learned about that history, I said, enough, if they can fly for their country, then I'm going to fly for my country too. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, the, the, I'm writing my new book now and and the chapter I just finished this morning is about the synapses, which are the connections between nerve cells in our body and, and synapses form from any sort of trauma, any sort of difficult situation. You make a synapse that helps you remember the pain associated with that. So you don't burn your hand every time you touch a stove, you know, you, you stop doing things that hurt and it would have been real easy for you to make a connection in your brain based on that authoritarian figure of a teacher telling you, you couldn't do something. So it's pretty remarkable that you push through that and and you kept with your dream. I love that story. Uh, It's resilience, right? It's, it's this holding on to your idea that your passion, your faith and and pressing through and not letting anything deter you. That's a, that's a good character trait. Well, you know, I'm 47 years old and I can still feel that F4 flying by. I can still smell that jet fuel. And even when that teacher said that when I was 12 years old, 
I could still sense that F4 phantom. And I kept thinking that this is my destiny. This is what I'm going to do. Wow. That's amazing. So um, you, you went to high school and did you, did you fly privately before you were in the Air Force? Yeah, I sure did. I took my first flying lesson when I was 12 years old, believe it or not. Wow. And I soloed my first aircraft when I was 16 years old out at North Las Vegas Airport, because by that time we were living in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I was very lucky and I give great credit uh, to being able to serve as a cadet in both the Air Force Junior ROTC at my high school, as well as the Civil Air Patrol programs in California, as well as in Nevada. And being in those programs, especially in those formative years where it's easy to get distracted, right, as teenagers, um, I was able to stay focused uh, by surrounding myself with people who were like-minded, by surrounding myself with people who believed in my dream as much as I did. Um, And so that's how I stayed focused through those tough teenage years. Remarkable. And then you got um, into the Air Force. And what was the process like? Were you... Were you into the Air Force as a pilot already? Was that your job from the time you signed up or do you have to get selected for pilot training or how does that work? Well, the very first thing I needed to do was to get a college degree and get commissioned right. an officer in the military because those two things are required in order to compete to be a pilot. So I had applied um, to the Air Force Academy and I'm happy to say, and I still can remember that moment too, I was uh, given early admission, like prior to Christmas, my senior year of high school. Wow. Um, it's kind of fun to go through your senior year of high school, knowing you already have your, your college acceptance there. I think it was October or November. Um, anyways, I got accepted to the Air Force Academy and spent four years there. As you know, it's an extraordinary um, institution that yep. not only develops you militarily and academically and physically, but it develops your character. Yep. Um, and so I was lucky enough to spend four years there and receive my commission. And during that time, I competed for a pilot slot. And um, again, I think timing, luck and circumstance. I always tell people I'm a product of TLC, timing, <laughs> luck and circumstance. Um, a lot of things had transpired during the academy. You know, uh, the law prohibiting women from being fighter pilots was actually lifted. And so at the end of my freshman, beginning of my sophomore year at the Air Force Academy, you know, the fact that I could actually make my childhood dream come true became a reality. And in those four years at the Academy, I worked as hard as I could to graduate as high as I could. uh, And I was able to garner a pilot slot as well as a commission as a lieutenant in the Air Force. Wow. And then getting getting the filer pilot selection depends on your performance during, during training, right? Sure. So pilot training at that time was about a year long. Um, There's about two dozen people in my class. I think we had about a 30% uh, washout rate at that time. Of those of us that graduated um, in my class, I graduated fourth in my class, which I'm very proud of. Sometimes I see things online that say I graduated number one. I'm here to tell you, Lee, I have never been number one at anything I've ever done, um, (laughs) ever. Uh, I was proud to graduate fourth. And the beauty of it was there was one F-15E Strike Eagle in the selection process. And at that time, they would list the aircraft available, and then we would stand up in graduation order and select the aircraft that we wanted. The Mm -hmm. fact that the F-15E Strike Eagle was the replacement for the F-4 Phantom meant a lot to me. And the fact that in my class, I was able to select the only F-15E Strike Eagle available uh, remains one of the most impactful and meaningful kind of moments of my life. That's cool. So. Curious curiosity. What were the the three in front of you? What aircraft did they choose? I think there was a there was F sixteens and an F fifteen C. I think two F sixteens and an F fifteen C. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So everybody fighter pilots. Yeah. Yeah. Great aircraft in their own right. Um, some of the top people in our class. Uh, one guy actually chose helicopters, um, which was certainly like non traditional. But isn't that amazing? He said, you know, don't choose the airframe, choose the mission. And it was the mission, yeah. yeah, it was the mission of doing like combat search and rescue that spoke to his heart. And I think that for him to not take a fighter aircraft, like when he could have, yeah, take a helicopter when it wasn't considered maybe cool, quote unquote, uh, yeah. that was admirable. And I think that's a valid and valuable lesson, right? Don't choose yeah. the aircraft, choose the mission. I think that's really, that's a good point. I might write a blog about that. <laughs> like that. You had a post, by the way, your Instagram channel is, is worth following. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. So you have a lot of really inspirational posts and, uh, and good photographs and some cool stuff. Um, but you had a post about that, about how you never finished first 
in your life. And tell us a little bit about what you wrote in that post. Well, I mean, I think sometimes people, um, when they see people succeeding or they see people who've done something, maybe that's a leader, unique and different. And certainly if you look at my CV and my resume, it is unique and it is different. Um, There's kind of this assumption, right, that that person is somehow different than everybody else, that somehow the path in front of them, you know, is is really, really smooth or was somehow easy. And, And I've had people say that to me before, like, you're just different than us. You must have just been you know, naturally gifted. And uh, I understand it, that it's coming as a compliment. Um, At the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, my gracious, like my path to the cockpit of these fighter jets was riddled uh, with twists and turns, mistakes, failures, bumps and bruises, you know, all along the way. And I I think it's a reminder to all of us that, you know, when you see someone that you consider uh, successful or lucky or whatever it is, that that's usually the end result of a lifetime's worth of work. That's and, right. And grit. That's right. And you talked about the the notion of sort of learning how to perform right up to the, the, the peak of performance. And that's that's not always about winning or being first. It's about performing as good as you can at, at the best level that you can all the time. I think it's uh, it's about being a master of your craft. And it's mm-hmm. about wanting to pursue this idea of mastery, regardless of that, what that is. You don't have to be a fighter pilot, right? You could be sure. a chef or a doctor or you yep. know, you could be an elementary school teacher. It doesn't matter. It's this constant kind of pursuit of can I, the individual, hone my skills to take it to the next level each day? It's not about what other people are doing, um, because mm-hmm. the second we put ourselves in competition with other people is the second we're going to lose focus. That's right. And so when you focus on your abilities and your capability to learn more or to hone those skills or to sharpen your sword, you know, I always ask, what can I be doing today to become a master of my craft? That's right. And that's something that kind of has driven me across the years. That's beautiful. So, so you got into Air Force pilot training, not knowing yet that you, that they were going to even allow you to become a fighter pilot which is super cool. And then that, that wall fell for you. And was your plan to get, to become a pilot and then advocate for getting to become a fighter, like to change the rules or was that your, was that your plan or did you just believe it was going to happen? Well, you know, I was hopeful that the law was going to change. I also knew that it really wasn't in my control. And I've always been someone who's pretty good about pretty good (laughs) about not trying to control things that I can't control. So when I went to the air force Academy and the law still prohibited women in my mind, I said, well, I can still serve my country. I can still wear my nation's uniform and I can still fly airplanes. And if I'm not going to be the fighter pilot, then I'd like to be the tanker pilot, the refueling aircraft who refuels those fighter aircraft so they can get where they're going. And so just still being able to be part of the team and support the overall mission was enough to continue to drive me to to service and to this goal of being a pilot. That's awesome. So then if, if the rule changed like shortly around the time you were entering that you were not only you were one of the very first women who became fighter pilots then. Yes, that's true. I was within that kind of first tranche of women that became fighter pilots and a huge shout out to the original woman fighter pilot, um, a mentor of mine by the name of Jeannie Flynn, who certainly um, blazed trails that the rest of us, you know, could certainly follow in her footsteps. And it, it meant a lot to have, you know, a few of those women uh, like Don Dunlap, Jeannie Flynn, who came before me. It was inspirational. It kept me going. Um, but yeah, I was kind of in that first group, at least within the United States Air Force. In what year were you, um, do you remember what year were you commissioned? I was commissioned on the 29th of May, 1996. 96. So you're about five years behind me. So I, I took my oath in 91, um, to come in and it was during peacetime. In fact, um, they had the television and the recruiting office was on as I swore in as a second Lieutenant. And while I was swearing in CNN was announcing the beginning of the first Gulf War. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, hold, hold on. I was signing in during peacetime and it was wartime by the time I was commissioned. And so um, it, you you pivoted from uh, all this training and all this school and all this this learning. And then at some point you're an active duty fighter pilot and now we're going to war. And what was that like for you? Were you already, were you, you weren't married and had kids yet, right? I wasn't married yet. So my very first fighter squad and I arrived in late 1998 or early 1999, forgive me. Um, and it was at RAF Lake and Heath, which was just outside of Cambridge, England. Uh, it was the 492nd fighter squad. And I was a first Lieutenant, you know, went around the years as far as I was as a fighter pilot. 
Um, this was still a culturally interesting time because as far as women joining fighter squadrons, that also was uh, posed a challenge for some of the men who needed to adjust to that. Um, but my first combat actually was flown, uh, over Kosovo and Serbia. So now I'm definitely dating myself, right? You remember in 1999, uh, how we were, uh, how we were over there and, and I'll be honest, looking back, I think to myself, my gracious, I'm so glad I just got my gear up on takeoff. Um, but I certainly learned a lot, right? I, I gained confidence. I gained an awareness of what it means, you know, to fly in a combat mission. I, was always crewed with a more experienced person. So being Mm -hmm. able to gain from their wisdom and how they could add common confidence to the sortie when I was just kind of this young pilot trying to figure it all out was, was pretty spectacular. Oh, and then, um, the day that changed all of our lives, of course, 9-11, um, I was on active duty at Wilford Hall Medical Center in San Antonio, you know, peacetime posture for that big military hospital. And, um, the airman comes running down the hall and told us all to come to the television. And, and we all saw what happened and, and we all knew right then, didn't we, that we were going to war again. Um, we yeah. didn't know who against yet, but we knew we were going to war. And then um, you got deployed at some point after that to, to the Iraq war. Right? What, tell well, us a little I, bit about it, your experience it, it, there. It's actually interesting. It took a couple of years, believe it or not, for me to make it to Iraq. I remember um, September 11th, very clearly, just like you, I was actually uh, on base at a dental appointment. And I was in the dental chair and they had a TV that we as patients could watch as we were getting our dental procedures done. And that's where I was watching the news. And at that point, they made an announcement on base for everybody to go back to their units. I arrived at the fighter squadron. Um, This was my second fighter squadron now. And by now I was a qualified flight lead. Um, I was also at that time um, engaged to uh, my husband, my now husband, Paul. And I remember everyone gathering around the operations desk and watching just multiple television consoles, thinking to ourselves like, yeah, it's pretty clear that this is an act of of terrorism and that we're about, you know, to go ahead and deploy. And within literally hours, our base was on, you know, a wartime posture and we were loading up live weapons on F-15Es on American soil. And that is what kicked off what we now know as Operation Noble Eagle, which is the Homeland Defense Missions. I didn't fly in that first like two or three weeks. Um, I was not experienced enough and rightfully so. They sent the more experienced people up. Um, But within a few weeks of that, I did join in on the Homeland Security Missions, um, providing support predominantly over New York City, as well as um, down south in Atlanta, et cetera. So we would be flying those missions, I think, as our country still does today. Wow. And then, so at some point, you, I don't know, if do you apply to Thunderbird to become a Thunderbird? Do they select you or how does that work? Oh, yeah, it's quite a process. So after that kind of September 11 experience, um, our squadron did not get called to combat. I ended up on a separate assignment with the 2nd Infantry Division in the Army um, on the DMZ in Korea. So I did that, and then I found my way back to RAF Lake and Heath for now my third fighter squadron tour. Mm -hmm. And this is where um, the Thunderbird kind of experience comes in. Um, I had found myself you know, mid-career with every single qualification and certification you could have as a frontline F-15E fighter pilot. And every year the Air Force sends out an email. It says the exact same thing at the exact same time every year. It says we're looking for three new Thunderbird pilots. Uh, It's a two-year assignment. There's six Thunderbird pilots that fly in the demonstration. So three pilots are new, three pilots are on their second year. It says we're looking for three new pilots. Here's the qualifications. Here's the application. And, you know, even though I had thought about being a Thunderbird since I was a kid, and we might want to talk about that for a second, every year I did the same darn thing, delete, 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 because in my mind, like other people become Thunderbird pilots, you know, not you. I told you I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, which, you know, is home to Nellis Air Force Base, which, you know, is home to the Air Force Thunderbirds. So it wasn't uncommon for me in high school to take my brown bag lunch out onto the football field eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and watch the Thunderbirds fly overhead. Wow. Yeah. You know, but I knew that it was hard enough to become a fighter pilot. It was even harder, statistically speaking, to be one of six of 12,000 active duty pilots to be a Thunderbird. So I always deleted this email. And then uh, one year I found myself again with all those qualifications, it was 2005. And as I read the email, this light bulb came on and I don't know what changed or what was different, but I just kept thinking in my head, why not me? Why not me? 
And, you know, I read through that application and I thought to myself, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. And, you know, with the support of my now husband, Paul, who said I should definitely try what he kept saying, what's the worst that's going to happen. You don't get picked and you get to fly this amazing F-15E strike wheel that you've been flying with all of these wonderful people. And he's an F-15 pilot too, right? He's not a pilot. He's a backseater. He's what we call a WIZO or a weapons systems operator. Right, right. For those of us that are old enough to remember Top Gun, I tell people, oh, I'm Maverick, he's Goose. Yeah. <laughs> I so can't he encourage you to apply. Anymore, though, because a lot of the younger people are like, Top Gun, what? Because <laughs> they haven't. Yeah, <laughs> what? There's a new one coming out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, he encouraged me to apply. And so, you know, it's a pretty gnarly application. The actual paper application, as you might imagine, you know, there's uh, letters of recommendation, a letter of why you want to be a Thunderbird. You have to submit all of your annual um, OPRs or performance reports, all of your annual flying check rider, flying test scores. Um, and then all these people put in an application and they pick about you know, a dozen people that are called semifinalists. And these 12 or so people will fly and join the Thunderbirds on the road at one of their deployed air show locations, spend some time with the team. They kind of send you away. And at that point, they narrow it down to about six people for about three positions. Um, those are called finalists. And as a finalist, you'll actually go to Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, spend time with the team. And this is where it gets formal. A lot of formal interviews, a lot of colonels, a lot of generals involved. Yeah. Um, and then from there, of course, uh, they select the final you know, Thunderbirds. And again, I'd like to highlight <laughs> timing, luck, and circumstance in my life because there were so many women who came before me that would have been great Thunderbird pilots would have been better Thunderbird pilots than I was, but they weren't afforded that opportunity. So I try to be very cognizant and remind people that it wasn't that I was special or unique or somehow the chosen one. I was qualified and I was given an opportunity and uh, a lot of women weren't given that opportunity before me. Well, I mean, I love this self-deference, but the, I mean, the fact is you're an Air Force fi- a fighter pilot and that, that is special and that, that's a, that's a big deal. And and so you were one of many really, really super qualified and talented pilots, not gender irrelevant, but, but you achieved something remarkable in your field. And that's one of the reasons we're talking today is that I love to talk to people who are at the top of their game. And I think it's inspiring for all of us to hear stories like yours. I mean, you, you did something twice that few or no women had ever done before. So, you know, I I was talking to Lisa, my wife earlier today, and I said that the the line that I want to get to with you is, is that lack of precedence is not lack of possibility. You you never let it stand in your way. So talk about the, there must've been a thought at some point, there's never been a woman to do this. And what was it like to kind of break through that, to, to press through that for you? Sure. You know, there was definitely that pressure, right? I mean, when you are the first woman to do something, especially something elite, especially in a male dominated career field, you know, real and perceived, I think that that pressure is there. And, you know, when I applied to be a Thunderbird, I applied to be a Thunderbird. I certainly didn't apply to prove a point. I didn't apply to be the first woman Thunderbird pilot. That was just timing. And I just kept reminding myself, like, you're doing this because it's it's something that you want to try, right? It's yeah. There's something fun about being competitive a little bit to seeing yeah. if you can achieve something. Um, I knew that it was hard. And I've always been someone who's driven to try the next harder thing. You know, is that going to make me more of a master of my craft, right? Can I yeah. hone my skills better and in a different way? So that drove me. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I, I wanted to do the Thunder mission, right? I was so proud of my Air Force. I have served with so many great Americans from so many backgrounds in combat, in peacetime, in training. And our job is to go out there and represent them, not us, them, you know, with the dignity and the honor and the respect that they deserved. And that was really exciting. And as long as I focused on the mission of the Thunderbirds, the why, the purpose, it made applying a lot easier. Now, Would I tell you it was all rose colored glasses and glitter? Well, no, because when you're different and you're doing something that hasn't been done before, you can really be a challenge to people's balance and you can really make other people feel uncomfortable. Um, And that certainly happened in my, you know, in my case. And again, I focused on this idea that I'm not doing this to prove a point. If you're uncomfortable, I don't know that it's my responsibility to make you comfortable, but it is my responsibility to live up to the Thunderbird standards and to do a good job. People ask me like, Oh, how are the guys? Oh, it must've been so hard. Here's the funny part. The five gentlemen that I flew with um, are friends to this day of mine. 
if I could have created a dream team in my imagination, it would not have been as good as the personalities and the people of character and skill that I flew with. And I am not pandering. These five guys were amazing and they didn't make it hard on me because remember Lee, they were my age. They never knew an air force without women fighter pilots in it. It was a non-issue that said where I did have issues were very much generational colonels and above. Right. They yeah, still, yeah. I remember, I remember specifically one time someone told me you're applying to be a Thunderbird, Nicole. I said, sure. They said, quote, we just let you women become fighter pilots. And now you want to take this and quote, oh. right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. You know, I think that they've had the same problem in the, in the Navy, right? Do they even still have, they had a female uh, blue angels pilot yet? So they have had a female Blue Angel pilot who flew their C-130 at Albert Aircraft, and she did an extraordinary job. They have yet to have a female fly in the F-18 demonstration, which actually blows my mind. Mm. Uh, I People ask me for the answer to that. I, I don't have one. Um, in fact, I just went three weeks ago to watch the Blue Angels fly. They were world class as always. Uh, my son wanted to go. He's obsessed with the Blue Angels, so that keeps me humbly. Um, <laughs> they were extraordinary as always, but it reminded me again that here we are, you know, 16 years after I was selected, and the Navy still hasn't had a female in their F-18 demonstration, and I, I don't know why. I don't. Wow. Oh, it's fascinating. So it, it's funny to me. I look up in the sky, and I see a jet go by. It doesn't have a pink contrail to tell me there's a, a female pilot, right? And I, I would I just – it's amazing to me that that was ever an issue because you would think when you're talking about operating a machine like that, that's not dependent on your muscle mass or anything about your, your body. It's about your brain and your heart and, and the performance of the machine. So you, um, you busted through that, that glass ceiling. So as it was, and, and you did a great job representing our country and, um, check out her social media, um, friends. I'll put um, a link in the show notes to the Instagram channel and there's some really fun, uh, and inspiring stuff. And I want to just pivot for a minute because I told you about 30 minutes. We're already past that. So I appreciate you a little bit extra time, but you got, uh, we could talk for a long time. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good conversation, but something happened to you in the, in the prime of your career, you're, you're doing this job. And before I forget one, one more little thing about that, becoming a Thunderbird pilot for you required you to switch aircraft to, I mean, you went from the F-15 Strike Eagle to the F-16, which is a single engine and was that a, was that a big deal? Was it hard? Is it like changing from your pickup to your sedan? Is it, I mean, what's it like switching aircraft like that? I like to remind people, like, I'm just a gal that grew up in Vegas, right? The fact that I got to fly two of the world's greatest fighter aircraft still blows yeah. my mind, right? What a privilege. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. By the time that you have the experience and the hours needed to apply to be a Thunderbird, you know, it's pretty easy to transition between aircraft, right? Throttle means faster and slower. Stick means climb or descend. Um, and so there's a kind of a transition course. It's a Thunderbird transition course at Luke Air Force Base. And it's very few flights. I can't remember if it was like eight or nine flights, something really short like that. Um, but I took off and landed the F-16 the very first time, you know, that I tried. Not because I'm special or excellent, but because of the hours and the experience in the F-15E right. that translated over into this, you know, F-16. I tell people a lot of times, you know, in those first few flights, it's like being in a rental car. You know, you, yeah. can, you can reach for the wipers, but you actually get the headlights and vice versa. You do that right. once or twice and then, you know, you figure it out. Right. And then, but then you're, you're not just driving the rental car down the highway. You're flying like high performance you know, formation flying. <laughs> that, that just seems like it would be an intimidating thing for me. Well, I mean, learning to fly the F-16 itself, the transition was not intimidating. Uh, to your point, that type of formation flying and that level of risk reward that we were willing to accept, you know, to put that formation together was at times um, intimidating. But like any other training process, whether it's in the military or even at a hospital where you work, right, there's yep. a training syllabus and it's crawl right. to walk to run. And you do things very methodically with everybody's buy-in through repetition and muscle memory, you gain trust. And as that trust grows, you bring those aircraft closer together and closer to the ground. And yeah. so that teamwork, trust, and discipline. Yeah, I love it. I just wanted to cover that ground because it was, uh, I, for, I had dozen Aldridge, Trevor Aldridge, I don't know if you know him, mm -hmm. um, just in the last cycle of Thunderbirds, he was on the show and I kept telling myself to ask him that and I forgot. So <laughs> I got you on. So, 
<laughs> now, so you're in the prime of your career and, and something tragic happened to you. And to just give us a little bit of your story of what happened and, and then we'll move on from there. Ooh, you say a little bit of your story, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's a big story. So I, uh, and it's everything to my life today. So in the summer of 2012, I was at the single greatest, most awesome, my favorite assignment. I was uh, had the honor of serving as the commander of the 333rd Fighter Squadron at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base wow. in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I was a lieutenant colonel at the height of my career. I was physically fit, mentally fit, spiritually fit. Everything was going right. And I started feeling sick. And I felt like I had the summer flu. And I also ended up with a rash on my hip. So I went to see um, the flight surgeon or the military medical provider on base. I said, Hey, I'm not feeling good. I can't really fly. I got this fever. And it was determined that I had had a spider bite. I was given five days of oral antibiotics, some topical ointment for the rash and sent on my way. Unfortunately for me, it was not a spider bite. Um, over the next few months, I would start experiencing some really bad neurological symptoms. So I would have paresthesia, pins and needles, numbness, um, I started having problems with my short-term memory, my ability to organize thoughts. Uh, I was having problems with my speech and word finding. I was stuttering. I was dropping things with my right hand, dragging my right leg. Now I'm speaking to a neurosurgeon. So of course you agree. The doctor's first reaction was we think you have multiple sclerosis. So I got some brain MRIs. There were non-specific white matter lesions. They said, we're going to track you for multiple sclerosis, but you can't fly anymore. And that was devastating. Yeah devastating because I'd wanted this since I was five years old. I'm now at the most important flying assignment in my career with a flying future in front of me as a Colonel, you know, or higher. And all of a sudden it's taken away. And they said, well, do you want to be medically retired or do you want to try to stay? I said, well, even if I'm not flying, I want to stay because I want to lead airmen and I want to be a part of a team and I can still contribute. And so rightfully so I was grounded. Um, and they ended up sending me to Rhode Island for uh, another master's degree there at Naval War College, where 10 months later, I pulled a tick off of my right thigh. At that point, all of my symptoms got really worse. Uh, at that point, they were able to diagnose me with Lyme disease and I was treated with a month's worth of oral antibiotics. However, I did not get better. Over the next four years, my symptoms would wax and wane in a very confusing fashion for both doctors and patient alike. Yeah. The symptoms would flare each time they came, they'd get worse. At my very worst, my symptom list was 63 long. I wrote these out, Lee. I wrote them out to try to organize with my doctors and follow this because it didn't make any sense. It's 63 long covering every system in my body, but nobody could figure it out. They still thought you're getting MS. You've been treated for your Lyme. It wow. can't be that you're getting MS. Oh, we just can't, you know, diagnose you yet because you haven't met all of the criteria. So in August of 2016, I was serving at the White House. In fact, I was like essentially the military advisor to Mrs. Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden. Wow. My office was in the East Wing. I'm a full bird colonel. Life is good. And I woke up in August of 2016 in my bed and I was essentially like paralyzed and locked in. I couldn't move or talk and had to wait for uh -huh. my husband to come find me. So. That was like a four year, just major neurological decline to where overnight I became completely dependent on other people for all of my activities of daily living. I went mm -hmm. from this physically fit, mentally, spiritually fit fighter pilot, fighter squadron commander to completely 100% broken. Uh, mm -hmm. The Air Force sent me up to Boston, Massachusetts, where, you know, there's a lot of great hospitals and specialty care. They went back to that tick bite tested me again. And it was discovered that I carried multiple pathogens and I was diagnosed with late stage neurological tick-borne illness. Wow. At that point, I couldn't talk. I was in a wheelchair and uh, I got a pick line for some IV antibiotics for three months. I did another like almost year on oral antibiotics because again, I had five different tick-borne pathogens. Yeah. And uh, for nine months, I couldn't walk, talk, read and write. And it took me another year in rehab to get to where I am today. My goodness. And they just took forever to figure that out. And it, it must've just emotionally just gutted you. Um, what did you do to get, so you you just told us what you did to get your body back. Like what'd you do to get your spirit back? Yeah. You know, I, I like to tell people doctors saved my life, but like nurses saved my soul. There's something to be yeah. said about the nursing care that I got and the people who came into my home and demonstrated that level of compassion. The fact that I chose the right man when I married, you know, so many years prior that yeah. stood by me 
believed me, that I had kids who understood, you know, or at least demonstrated even at the young age of five at that time, a level of compassion that I'm still proud of them, you know, to this day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm not going to sit here and pretend and, and you know, to tell you or your audience that like, I didn't have these moments where I felt sorry for myself and that I wanted to give up. You know, when you're a fighter pilot type A in control and you can't walk top read or write for nine months, it's hard. And it's hard all around. It's hard for everybody. And the day of my retirement came the 29th of December, 2017. And I was bedridden and housebound and there was no ceremony. They mailed me my retirement certificates. Thank you for your Uh. Right. It kicked me while I'm down kind of a thing. And I still hold a little bit of a grudge <laughs> against the Air Force no on that. Kidding. It still wow. hurts to this day. But as I laid there, I thought to myself, I had this like, you know, big moment, like, who am I if I'm not wearing my nation's uniform? What is my contribution to society if I'm not a fighter pilot? How am I going to provide for my family? Because they're medically retiring me yeah. overnight. What is it that gives my life meaning? I can't read. I can't write. I have chronic pain and chronic fatigue. Nobody's going to hire me. All of these negative thoughts. And I let myself ruminate in that for about three days because I think that's human. And I think sometimes you've got to get there and get it out. And then one day as I was laying there, these words came to my head clear as day, Lee. It said, yield to overcome. Wow. Yield to overcome is the phrase that got me off the couch and working harder in rehab and being forward looking to me, it meant not surrendering or quitting or giving up. It meant forgiving everything myself. What happened? I didn't ask to be bit. I didn't ask to get sick. It is what it is. And it was a reminder to me to not ask myself the right, the wrong questions, right? What I can't do anymore. Right. Ask yourself the right questions. You know, what is it that you can do? And yielding to what happened allowed me to move forward. And I I like to use this other metaphor. I tell people the runway behind you is always unusable. All you ever have is the runway that's in front of you. And it was that moment on the couch, those worlds yield to overcome that freed me from my past and propelled me forward. Wow. That's a powerful story. We, and you should be selling that t-shirt on your website, by the way, if you're not yet. (laughs) You know what's funny? I'm actually working on a a shop on my website and hopefully by Christmas we'll have some items out with phrases. That needs to be on there. Um, The the runway behind you quote is good too, but it wouldn't fit on a t-shirt quite as well. And when we lost our son in 2013, it was, it was that, that thing where you can't fix that. Like there, there's no fixing it and, and you can't get it back. You can't change anything about what happened back there. And your only choice is you, you can just die or you can find a way to go forward, right? And that's what we had to do. And that's exactly what you just described, friend. Whatever you're facing right now, like you need to yield to it, not not to give up, but right. to just acknowledge it that, yes, this, this thing really is happening, or yes, this thing really did happen. What now? Exactly. What now? And I, I sat there, you know, and as I went through rehab and as I tried to, you know, to reinvent myself to what I do, you know, today, I had this other like realization, like my whole life, right? Since I was a kid, I thought that my legacy, my impact, you know, who I was, was to be a fighter pilot, you know, was to maybe become a general officer someday. That was my, my big contribution. As I sit now looking back, um, I realized that that was never my ending all along. I I became a fighter pilot and officer and a leader in order to hone the characteristic skills and traits I needed as a, you know, with a fighter pilot mindset, if you will, to survive my illness, to advocate for myself And also to do what I do now, which is to give voice to the voiceless, all those other late stage tick-borne illness patients who are laying on a couch right now, who literally can't speak my whole illness, my whole, my whole career, everything is culminating in this moment because I have more of an impact now positively on people on at a grander scale, more quickly than if I had ever stayed in the air force, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. That's right. That's amazing. So you now you go around the world, you, you teach people about these these uh, rare diseases and, and you help people understand, you raise money and advocate and really have a beautiful platform, great website, NicoleMalinkowski.com. Um, and you're just doing great work. And I think it's a it's a beautiful story of how you've overcome lots of lots of barriers and challenges in your life. And and uh, I just really appreciate you coming to talk to us about it for a few minutes today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say my number one job in this world is being a mother to my 11 year old twins 
who, you know, as I was going through all of this hardship with my illness, you know, and I couldn't play with them and I couldn't talk with them, you know, sometimes I thought, what kind of mother am I? And then I realized, you know what, I'm a great mom because I'm teaching them resilience. And they're watching what it means to be hopeful and have optimism and move forward. So being a wife and a mom, if that's all I have, that's everything I need. Amen. That's, that's exactly right. The family is everything, right? They give us the the wind and the power to do what we do. And, and uh, you got, you just got a great story and um, I'm really proud um, of of our country that raises up these people uh, like you who do such remarkable things. And, and, uh, I know you're not going to say it, but I mean, why are the Thunderbirds so much cooler than the Blue Angels? Like, <laughs> You know what? Like I said, my son is obsessed with the Blue Angels, so he keeps me humble every day. I'll tell you what, both teams have, an, you know, a very, very similar mission and both of them max perform the aircraft that they fly. The yeah. difference you see in the air show are differences between aircraft capabilities. That's right. The pilots and the officers and enlisted behind it are the awesomeness that you'll find across our military. That's exactly right. And that's uh, last year when uh, they did those those team shows together across the country to raise people's hope. That was really cool, like when, when they flew cool. together all over the country. Very cool. <laughs> hey, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it and uh, hope our paths cross again someday. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I also want to thank you for your service. What a great conversation that was. Uh, such a great honor to get to talk to such a um, accomplished and inspiring American. And we are grateful that Nicole took the time to be with us today. Listen, friend, there's a lot to learn from her story. Number one, precedence is not the same as possibility. Just because something's never been done before doesn't mean you can't do it. She set her eyes on something. She decided to do it. She worked hard. She took advantage of the opportunities afforded her. And she did a great job. Please check out NicoleMalikowski.com. It's a great website. She's got all kinds of inspiring content there and there's all kinds of videos and youtube videos about her and and talks that she's given and her blog is very inspiring she's got some great leadership ideas and you should check it out nicolemalikowski.com i'll put the link in the show notes i'm always telling you to start today this was a great example of somebody who did that even when she couldn't walk couldn't feed herself couldn't talk anymore she fought through that illness got back on her feet you know found a new way to, to advocate and lead, and she's inspiring people all over the world today. I'm excited to have brought you this great guest. Tomorrow we got something even uh, additionally exciting, something fun for you tomorrow. And as always, my friend, start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren Podcast is listener-supported. Check out patron.podbean.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. Patrons and partners get free books, transcripts, patron-only monthly episodes, and more. And partners like you allow us to stay ad-free and keep on growing around the world. 77 countries last month. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And go to wleewarnmd.com slash newsletter to connect to the newsletter where you connect to people all over the world who are trying to change their minds and change their lives. The theme music for the show is Make a Joyful Noise by our friend Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by Tommy and the great people over at Tommy Walker Ministries. Get the music for free and consider supporting their great work at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. That's TommyWalkerMinistries.org. And if you need prayer, please go to the prayer wall at W1MD.com slash prayer. When should you pray? Always. When should you give up? Never. That's Luke 18. One. Check out the prayer wall, W1MD.com slash prayer. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. Nicole Malakowski did it, and you can too, but you have to start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you. Have a great day.